The views expressed on this broadcast of the Take 12 Recovery Radio Show do not necessarily reflect those of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting or its affiliates. KHLT and Take12Radio.com are not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. I'm the one down on the floor Telling these people that I ain't there no more Calling in the street just about to reach my mind Welcome to Walking Through the Big Book with Chris Schroeder and Monty Meyer. Now, here's those two guys who investigate prior to contempt, Chris and the Monty Man. That's right. We are back for another wonderful episode of Walking Through the Big Book with Chris Schroeder. It is a pleasure to be with you, my friends. I know you're going to enjoy this show. We are uh, really on part two of We Agnostics out of the big book uh, uh, of Alcoholics Anonymous, specifically known as the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Chris, welcome to the show this week, my friend. Uh, Kind of getting through some pneumonia, are you? Yeah, I'm on the tail end of a little bit of pneumonia, if you can imagine such a thing. Yeah, we we can't we can't have that now. You've got much too much too <laughs> work to do, and uh, so don't be sick too long. But we got to take care of ourselves in recovery as well, don't we? Yes, absolutely. You know, this pneumonia thing wouldn't be so bad except that you're sick with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, I mean, I I think I had it once years ago, but was it just fill your lungs up with junk? Well. <laughs> It's it's not the most pleasant of experiences. <laughs> the, the first day, I was having trouble breathing. And what happens is you can't get enough oxygen when you have pneumonia, so your heart starts to pump harder. Oh, so my, okay. blo- my, uh, my heart rate was up around 110 when I was lying down. And oh, it's, it's pretty unnerving. Oh, my goodness. Well, we know you're going to get better. Uh, all of us that believe in prayer will be praying for you. And, and uh, you know... Uh, God, God is good. So, what do we got in store for us today? Well, we're we're on part two. This may even take three parts because this this chapter is so significant as far as uh, building a foundation for mm-hmm. your recovery. And uh, again, you know, there's, there's so much detail in it, and it's instructional, it's informative. Uh, but basically what what it's kind of designed for, I think, is to, like, soften up the agnostic a little bit, you know, rough him up a little bit and uh, and let him know that uh, agnosticism is probably not the best world perspective to have uh, if, you're, uh, if you're suffering from alcoholism or if you've been placed in a position where no human aid can relieve you of your obsession. You, you, you're going to need to probably change your mind about a few things in the spiritual world. Yeah. And this is such a great chapter to, to, to kind of loosen up uh, uh, those agnostic thought processes that one might have. Let, let's uh, review real quick uh, for, for those who may be joining us for the first time. You said something that uh, I had never thought of before last week uh, about the fact that this was titled We Agnostics and not To the Agnostics and that we all have a little bit of that agnosticism going on. Uh, I, I, bu- I believe so. Uh, you know, our faith is never perfect. Right. Um, and what ha- what can happen, what can happen, I know what happens at least to me, is that the, some things I'm not quite willing uh, to place in God's hands, some things in my life, whether it be my love life or my work relationship or, you know, my, my relationship with my family, I want to get in there and mess with it. Uh, I, I believe at certain times using spiritual principles in those relationships is not going to get me the desired uh, results. So when when we believe that God can't be a better manager than us, uh, that's agnosticism. Yeah, sure it is. 
sure it is. And, and that, that's why I, I like you, uh, like the fact that it says we agnostics, because uh, it doesn't exclude anybody, really. No, yeah. no it doesn't. And <laughs> even, even the most devout have to admit, sometimes, uh, the, sometimes their faith isn't uh, ironclad. You know, oh, of um, course. That's what really makes us human. Yep. So where where are we uh, where do we leave off last week? Well, we're going to start off on the uh, the bottom paragraph on page forty six. Again, this is a fourth edition yep. uh, copy of Alcoholics Anonymous. And everybody gets your... our relief. We discovered we did not need to consider another's another's conception of God. This is a this is a great uh, statement mm-hmm. for people who might have. Uh, gained the wrong perspective in some of their religious experiences from childhood or or even after uh, we we really don't necessarily have to believe in a specific conception of God someone else's conception of God and that that leaves enough latitude I believe for everybody to enter this arena now you know, I think I've said this before, but I'll, I'll say it again. The Let's first time I would have uh, walked into a, a, a support group, uh, someone would have said, Chris, your only hope is uh, is a, 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 a partnership with Jesus Christ. Yeah. What would have happened to me is I would have said, thank you for the information. That won't work for me. I guess I need to look elsewhere. And why now, would it, why, I, Chris? Why would it have affected you that way? I'm just, I'm just curious. Be, because my particular uh, conception of Christianity and 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 Jesus at that time was riddled with prejudice. There you go. Okay. Okay. Now, now I would have known that Jesus would not have been the answer for me, and I would have walked out. Now, the fact of the matter is, Jesus very well could have been my answer. I would have been wrong, but I would have known to the, to the, to the core of my being that a, a Jesus answer wouldn't have worked for me. Mm-hmm. And it's because of the experiences I had up to that period of Before. time with religious people, with the conceptions of God that were, um, uh, that, that were uh, you know, in my mind at that time from different places and different people. So when it basically says we don't need to consider another's conception of God, I think it allows the person enough latitude. If they are coming in with preconceptions or prejudices, it allows them enough uh, leg room, basically, Mm -hmm. to be able to stay. Bill knew, Bill knew very, very well that a lot of people are going to come in with prejudices. A lot of people are going to come in with misconceptions. And he, he didn't want to lose people at the door. Yeah. Uh, so I believe, I, I believe that uh, not only he, but uh, some of the people who he uh, uh, consulted with putting this book together um, basically said you, you need to be a little bit tolerant uh, uh, of, other, of people's conceptions sure. of God. Sure. And he did. Again, they they ask you in so many places in this book to please set aside your prejudices on organized religion or or God or whatever, because uh, because you're going to need God or you're going to probably die. So we don't want you to think that this is not an answer that's going to work with you. You know, uh, uh, today I know, uh, I know exactly that my relationship with my Creator is what's keeping me safe and protected, is um, uh, to, to the best of my ability, I allow, um, I allow the, the Spirit in uh, to help guide and direct me in my life. And, and I know that's the most significant thing uh, that, that I can imagine in my life. However, the day I, the the day I you know walked into a support group, you're you're just you just could not have convinced me mm-hmm. that this was going to be a significant answer mm-hmm. in my life. I, I just wouldn't have thought so. I needed enough time. I needed enough time uh, to to go through enough of the processes to start to develop uh, faith and experience. Mm-hmm. And it it also it, this also allows the person that is coming in that may have had a real positive religious experience with with whatever faith they have uh, to be able to feel comfortable in 
in any meetings, uh, 12-step or otherwise, because it's their conception too. So, so they have no reason to feel uncomfortable either. So, so both parties can feel at home. Yeah, yeah. You know, the doors need to swing wide so that no one, uh, you know, no one is cast out. Yeah. Uh, whether it be by you know others or by uh, their own prejudices or misconceptions, uh, I I, t- I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly they've passed this around to. Um, people, um, uh, you know, professionals in religion, uh, to, to make sure that there's nothing in here that's going to, uh, going to upset anybody uh, who is part of an organized religion. And, you know, the uh, Catholics and, and different, uh, uh, different uh, priests and ministers, you know, read the original manuscript and said, no, no, there's, there's nothing really wrong with this. And an organization that I'm, I'm, I'm uh, part of, Monty, uh, even got the opportunity to present this book to uh, the royal family in uh, part of the royal family in Saudi Arabia. Wow! In Saudi Arabia, the, they've got a, an addiction problem. You know, it may not be as great as in America, but they, but they've got an addiction problem. They have the money to deal with it, and they wanted uh, they wanted to know what worked. So, so some of our people went over there and placed this book in front of. Uh, uh, so, some of the religious leaders in Saudi Arabia, and after they got through with it, they said, "This is Islam. We have no problem with this." Wow! Uh, in other words, the the spiritual um, exercises, the spiritual information in this book, does not go contrary, really, to any uh, any mm-hmm. religion. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it may not uh, it may not line up so well with uh, with Hinduism or some other things as it does with the monotheistic uh, right. uh, faith. Uh, but there's nothing in here that really is really upsetting to anyone, uh, not, and certainly not that I know of. So it was very, very well thought out. It, it may not be completely well written, you know, Bill was <laughs> really an author, but it certainly is well thought out. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and to affect a contact with him. They're always talking about a contact with God. You know, that's almost mystical in its, uh, in its ramifications. Uh-huh. I've done a lot of study on the mystics because, uh, Monty, I believe that the alcoholic is a mystic in waiting. In other words, what the, what the religious mystics uh, would do in the history of Christianity and, and the other, uh, other faiths, is that they weren't, uh, they weren't satisfied with, um, doctrine. They weren't satisfied with theology. They wanted a connection with the divine. They wanted to feel it. They wanted to experience it. And the thing is, I think with alcoholics and addicts, I think, I think we're mystics in waiting. I think we're looking for a connection to the divine. I think we go after it sometimes with booze and drugs and sex mm-hmm. and gambling and, you know, uh, buying things, you know, going on on spending sprees. I think we're looking for um, a connection with the divine, something to make us feel good. And I, I just uh, I liken the alcoholic to uh, to a mystic, someone who needs that direct connection. And the great thing about Bill Wilson is he's always talking about contact. He's talking about uh, the consciousness of God, the p- conscious presence of God, a contact with God. Uh, this is mentioned over and over in this text, and you know it really, it really is amazing. You know, there's a lot of books on spirituality and religion out there that do not go that far. No, they don't. As soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things we begin to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction, provided we took other simple steps. That's an important thing. Um, remember, it, it said that uh, a code of morals or ethics is not going to be enough. Not enough, right. We're not going to be able to stay sober on theology or doctrine. We actually need to take action. The mystics took action. You know, they did a lot of meditation and prayer and and, and, you know, all kinds of activities and actions uh, to try to get closer to God. Uh, we don't have to go, we don't have to go and sit on top of a Himalayan mountain. 
uh, there are some simple steps in this chapter that if we follow, and the chapters that follow, uh, if we integrate them into uh, uh, how we operate as human beings, we are going to attain that contact with God. You know, talk about uh, talk about gospel. Gospel meaning uh, good news. Good news. Yeah. This book is good news, yes. and Bill Wilson even said that this is good news for the alcoholic, and uh, I absolutely agree with that. Yep, me too, buddy. Here's another great thing. We found that God does not make too hard terms with those who seek him. So the, so if you're sitting there saying, you know, I don't think God's going to be talking to me, or he's, he's not paying attention to my life, you know, look at, look at how awful my life is. He couldn't have had anything to do with it if he was an interventionary deity. That's not really, uh, that's not really accurate. Uh, to the extent that you seek God, um, you, you, you find God. Mm-hmm. Now, now, God may not manifest in the ways that you think, uh, but from the very beginning, Monty, t- tell, tell me if this isn't your experience. Do you remember the, in the beginning when you first got sober, there was, there was almost a period of divine coincidences? Oh, absolutely. Every single day, every time I turned around. Every time I turned around. And what I believe that that, that was, it was little hugs from God telling me to keep going. Mm-hmm. Because if you would have ran statistics on these coincidences, it, it would have been in the millions to one. You know, one thing after another happening that, that was so unusual or so improbable. Uh, but it let me know that I was starting on a spiritual journey, and it let me know I was going in the right direction. You know, when people say to me, uh, well, don't you think that was a coincidence? I always say, well, that's funny. Every time I, I pray, a coincidence happens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, you get to a point where you be- you don't believe in coincidences anymore. That's right. You believe in God. And that's part of the spiritual awakening, I believe. Mm-hmm. And, and it really happens to anybody, I think, that's, that's serious uh, about getting sober and participating in fellowship. <clears throat> to us, the realm of the Spirit is broad, roomy, all-inclusive, never exclusive or forbidding to those who earnestly seek. That's a great statement. Yeah. Too. Broad, roomy, and all-inclusive. Everybody can fit into it. Yeah. It is open, we believe, to all men. When, therefore, we speak to you of God, we mean your own conception of God. This applies, too, to other spiritual expressions which you find in, you may, you find in this book. Do not let any prejudice you, ha- you may have against spiritual terms deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. This is all unbelievably profound uh, uh, spiritual uh, spirituality here. I think this is a great instruction for a lot of the things in this book. Uh, don't let prejudice get in your way, and honestly ask yourself what these things mean to you. At the start, this was all we needed to commence spiritual growth, to affect our first conscious relation with God as we understood him. You know, our relationship with God, what, what are some of the things you need to do to have a good relationship with somebody? Well, I, one of the first things I need to do is I need, I need to get to know them. Um, at some point, I'm going to grow to trust them to a certain extent. Um, now, there, there's, there's a lot of aspects. Spend time with them. Exactly. Time, yeah. communication. Uh, presence. You, you need to be present. Uh, so, so if we're going to be building a conscious relationship with God, there are some there are some things that we're going to need to do. We're we're going to have to we're going to have to spend some time with this. We're going to uh, it, it later on in this book. It starts to give us some uh, beginning principles in prayer and meditation. But I think that's absolutely essential uh prayer and meditation are absolutely essential for developing that relationship in god I, you know I, I do a lot of things in my life monty um a lot of reading you know a, a lot of participation in different things uh whether they be recovery or social and and in those uh in those things i try to stay present uh I, I, you know, one of the one of the great movies way back when was uh, God is my co-pilot. 
Do you remember that? Yes, I now, do. I'm not saying God is my co-pilot. I think, I think he's more a pilot. Pilot, but, I hope so, yeah. <laughs> but but, uh, but to, to, to be aware uh, that God is with me mm-hmm. on this journey, it's, it's very, very important to me. Yeah. There was a book, The Way of the Pilgrim. It was a wonderful book that was written several hundred years ago about a, a mystical experience that this individual uh, was on. And he was, uh, the only book he had with him was the Philokalia, which is a, uh, a compendium of uh, very early Christian writings. And he was going around, and he got hooked on something that St. Paul said. St. Paul said, pray without ceasing. Mm-hmm. And he took that literally. He, 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 he felt like his entire life almost needed to be a prayer. And I've worked with that concept uh, myself uh, over the years, always being uh, aware, trying to always be aware of the conscious presence of God. Mm. It it, it wraps around me. It comes through me. It's part of everything around me. And um, and to just be uh, aware of that uh, of that presence, it's um, you know, it says in the step book that that. um, you know, a lot of people see this as a weakness. They think uh, they think that God or spiritual processes are for the weak. Uh, actually, um, it gives strength to an individual, and I found that I've gotten a lot of my strength from that too. Uh, you get to move away from prayer, and uh, you, I'm sorry, you, you get to move away from fear and anxiety and everything else when you start to believe uh, that God is part of your um, your your. Um, your operational system. Yeah. He's there yeah. with you all the time. And, uh, you know, these are concepts that, uh, that I've developed uh, for myself over the years. Um, in the beginning, you know, if, if this is the first time you've been exposed to this chapter, you probably have a lot of work to do. You probably uh, have a relationship to start building. But after a while, the relationship builds to a point where there's an incredible amount of strength in it. You, you know that from your own experience. Yeah. You bet. You bet. And when, when I am uh, when I am weak, God is able to be strong in my life. It's that whole thing about powerlessness again. Yeah, that's true. You know, yeah. we, we both, uh, Monty, we were talking before the show, we both have some, some challenges ahead of us. Yeah. Um, there's some uncertainty in our lives about a few things. Uh, but you mentioned, and, and I'll have to agree with you, that there's not a lot of anxiety uh, wrapped around uh, right. wrapped around that. Right. Uh, you get to a point where you know that even if tough things happen to you, uh, there's a divine plan. And usually, um, I hate to use this cliche, but usually when one door closes, another one opens. Yeah. And that's just been so true in my life. The things that I thought were the absolute worst things that could possibly happen to me opened the door for the next better thing. And and if, if I would have... Um, if I would have completely been in charge of running my own life, <laughs> and, I, and I would have been able to stay put, I would have stayed put uh, way back, and I wouldn't have experienced the absolutely wonderful things that have happened uh, um, through the years. Yeah. Afterward, we found ourselves accepting many things which then seemed entirely out of reach. That was growth. But if we wished to grow, we had to begin somewhere. So we used our own conception, however limited it was. We needed to ask ourselves but one short question. This is basically the question that you ask yourself for step two. This is the step two consideration. So step one is basically everything up to page 47. Right now, it starts asking you about step two. Step, step two really is a, a, a conclusion that you need to come to in your mind and you're either there or you need to go back through the material to the point where you're convinced that you you, you know you, you, that uh, you're alcoholic and cannot recover on your own unaided will yeah but here's the the second uh second step um, uh question that you need to ask yourself proposition do i now believe or i am, am i even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself now, today, it's very, very easy for me to say yes to this. Um, as I was approaching this material the first time, I had some questions. I wasn't ready to answer that right away. Uh-huh. Power greater than myself, well, what exactly do you mean by that? Um, 
it's exactly what it says. Uh, if I cannot recover from alcoholism myself, if I have an obsession of the mind that I'm not in charge of that's going to drive me back to drink, if I have an allergy of the body that's going to continue to force me to drink as much as I can humanly drink every time I start, then I'm powerless. I need to I need to be at least willing to believe that there's a power greater than myself, or else I've got nowhere to go. I'm mm-hmm. stuck on step one. Mm-hmm. But once you uh, once you can admit to yourself that yeah, okay, there's a power greater than myself. Some some people say, all right, uh, uh, the fellowship, the support group, is a power greater than myself. The sponsor or spiritual advisor is a power greater than yourself. You can start there. Um, in a, in a healthy spiritual maturity, it's going to quickly go from the support group or the sponsor to God. But you can start. You can start with uh, with the group and uh, you know with the with uh, the advisor or sponsor. Uh, but if you're doing the right things, if you're taking the steps, then it's going to mature into um, into a relationship with your Creator. Otherwise, we're in deep weeds. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, uh, again, <laughs> the fellowship mention. and the and the sponsors, uh, they're human powers. Yeah. You you can start there, but you need you need to quickly move to uh, a deeper understanding of God. You know, th- there's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of talk uh, throughout the different fellowships over the years and, and you hear a lot of really trite sayings. And one of them is is God can be the doorknob as long as he's not you. Yeah, um, I, I, you've you've heard that, and you probably disagree with that as much as I do. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I I really do think that this must this needs to be a little bit more meaningful than a doorknob. Mm-hmm. You know, what if somebody knocks the house down and there's no more doorknob? You know, uh, right? And, and, a, and a doorknob is not uh, not something that's going to uh, going to give you guidance and direction in your life. So really, you know, uh, as soon as we can. Um, what happens is when we open the door uh, to God with willingness, God does not make too hard terms with those who seek Him. And what happens is you start to mature. You know, it's it's happened with you. It's happened with me. You start to mature uh, to a point where this is all really working well in your life. As soon as a man can say that he does believe or is willing to believe, we emphatically assure him that he is on his way. It has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. <clears throat> that was great news to us, for we had assumed we could not make use of spiritual principles in se- unless we accepted many things on faith which seemed difficult to believe. Mm. I know, uh, I know, I had a lot of uh, a lot of prejudices, and I saw a lot of things. Um, kind of the wrong way. Like, like, you know, it's not like I hadn't been exposed to the Bible before uh, I got into AA, but where I was reading things literally um, and, ex- and expecting, like, uh, 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 you know, a literal interpretation, really I should have been looking at it metaphorically. And, you know, there's some things that have changed uh, in, in my understanding of spirituality and of uh, religious principles and spiritual principles where uh, I think I understand them on a deeper level and can accept them. In the beginning, you know so many things that aren't true. And I think it's another, another place where you really, really have to be open and willing um, uh, to, to change your mind, to be open to a new experience, to be open to new information, uh, or else what you can do is you can prejudice yourself right back out into the street. Yeah. When people presented us with spiritual approaches, how frequently did we all say, I wish I had what that man has. I'm sure it would work uh, if I could only believe as he believes, but I cannot accept as surely true the many articles of faith which are so plain to him. So it was comforting to learn that we could commence at a simpler level. And it certainly was with with me. One of the things I always thought, Monty, was I thought I was burdened with a mind. You know, there may be a lot of people that can believe something, you know, but I'm just too smart. Or, you know, it's it's kind of ego uh, 
it's, it's kind of a manifestation of ego, an intellectual mm-hmm. ego. Mm-hmm. And really what I found out as I moved forward is I didn't know as much as I thought I did. I didn't understand as clearly as I thought I did. And to be able to grow and remain teachable, you need to be able to set aside that prejudice, that, um, that being absolutely certain that you understand. There's just so many things I understood, but my understanding was wrong. Does that make any sense? It, it makes absolute sense, and I think one of the uh, one of the things that we that we misunderstand in this in this uh, paragraph, it says, um, "If I can only believe as he believes, thinking that if I don't be- if I don't believe exactly how that guy believes about his spiritual principles, then there is no way that I can grow and mature in my relationship with a Creator." And that's not that's not true. I, I have many many Christian brothers and sisters that we don't see eye to eye on many, uh, for lack of a better term, theological issues. But but we're all growing in God, and, uh, and I, I think that's one of the beautiful things uh, uh, about the fellowship. Um, we kind of get stuck on this thing. Well, if I don't do it exactly like so and so, who seems to have it all together, whoop, stop there because he probably doesn't have it all together. <laughs> uh, that that I'm, it's not going to work. And you know, I I uh, I've heard people say, you know, I wouldn't suggest my program for anybody. It might get them drunk. It always drives me crazy when I hear that. Um, but the the deal of it is, if you want what somebody has. Maybe it's okay to try to do what they do. You know, I think I think it's certainly good to have uh, spiritual guidance from people who who are more or who are further down the path. Yeah, I also I also believe though for this to be absolutely vital, we need to be able to internalize it. We need to make this faith ours. Yep. So if there are some things that just stop you from believing anything. Uh, you, you need to you need to set those aside uh, to to be able to keep moving forward. You know, I, I've I've probably got an unorthodox faith system myself. Uh, it's built on a lot of studies that I've done myself, a lot of uh, divergent uh, religious material. You know, it's probably not uh, as orthodox as as one might uh, you know one might hope. <laughs> but what it is is it's mine and yeah. it works. Yeah. And the only way I got to it was by being open to these spiritual concepts mm-hmm. and uh, being teachable as far as uh, spiritual principles and, and even religious principles are concerned. Mm-hmm. And, you know, today uh, today my faith has, uh, uh, ha- has been strong enough, you know, uh, and I give all glory to God, but my faith has been strong enough uh, the you know, come December, I'm going to be celebrating 20 years, God willing. Whee! And, you know, that itself is uh, more than miraculous when you look at just how much trouble I was in in the 80s. Uh, I mean, I was going down fast. You, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure in, in, in your area, but uh, in my area, Monty, about every year we bury somebody. Oh, absolutely. You know, we bury somebody yeah. who's in one support group uh, or another. Yep. And last week, and we we lost we lost an individual. Now, now this individual was CEO of one of the major hospitals in New Jersey. I mean, he was he was a huge executive. And what happened was, little by little, uh, alcoholism cut him down to the point where he had lost his job. Um, you know, I was instrumental in, in getting him into uh, treatment. Uh, he, he ended up in the last three months, he was in three different treatment centers. He could not open his mind up enough to start to accept spiritual principles. He knew too much. He was a, a man of medicine. He had achieved too much in his life. And, you know, for, for somebody like me or, or some of the other people to try to give him instruction it was very very difficult for him to accept it mm. because he had accomplished so much uh, seemingly on his own mm-hmm. he figured he could accomplish this on his own mm. but what happens is you can't accomplish recovery on your own right if you've gone down the scale far enough you have crossed the line uh, and you are too far gone uh, uh, for human aid to help you, yeah. and 
that sometimes is the most difficult thing to explain to somebody. How do you t- how do you tell somebody who was running a major hospital that he's 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 ill in a way he doesn't understand. He's in way more trouble than he thinks he is, and he needs to get with you and start to work a spiritual program. It's 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 <laughs> difficult. It's difficult to internalize, and and we lost him and we buried him last week. Oh. And it's, uh, you know, it's every single time, it's, uh, it's a shame, yeah. you know, when, when we can't get through to people. And I would think that um, what was directly responsible uh, for, this, for this individual not making it was his inability to accept um, the spiritual tools. Yeah. And, again, this is a, you know, it's a tricky, it's a tricky slope. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of times, our intellectual pride um, keeps us from digging into this. But again, would you rather be right intellectually, or would you rather <laughs> survive? Yeah, is sometimes the question <clears throat> that we have to ask ourselves. And, and this is where that that statement that you could be too smart to get this thing comes from. I think so. I yeah. think you can be too intellectually arrogant. Yeah, uh, 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 to, to get this because. It's almost too simple to work. I mean, when you look at it intellectually, like, how, how is this supposed to work? But, you know, you need to set that aside and understand that it works. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's literally millions of positive examples of how this works. And, you know, you've been failing. There's, uh, there's a, a process whereby rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly uh, tried the process uh, set aside whatever you think about it all and, and get involved in this. Just, mm-hmm. just do it. Mm-hmm. You know? Again, we're, we're more interested in what your feet are doing than in what your lips are doing. You know? yeah, and it's not uh, going to kill you. It's not going to hurt you. <laughs> so why not? None of, this, none of these exercises are designed to harm you. Yeah. Um, and some of them look scary in the beginning. You know, uh, the fifth step, uh, the ninth step, they look scary. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is they're, they're about... Uh, they're about healing the wounds of alcoholism. I mean, do you want to heal? Uh, it's about uh, becoming free from the obsession and the compulsion and the dysfunction. How free do you want to be? Uh, sometimes you need to just tell them, shut up and let's do this. You, know? uh, you can tell me at the end that it didn't work, but I don't want to hear a lot of argument before we even get started. Uh, because it, there's a real good possibility you are wrong. Uh, you, alert the presses. Uh, an alcoholic is wrong and might have to admit it. Uh, besides the seeming inability to accept much on faith, we often found ourselves handicapped by obstinacy, sensitiveness, and unreasoning prejudice. Who, me? <laughs> you know, i got to say, uh, I was uh, obstinate, I was sensitive, and I had a ton of prejudice. That that nails me to the wall, you know, in my first year of sobriety. Right. Many of us have been so touchy that even a casual reference to spiritual things made us bristle with antagonism. And that's me, too. This sort of thinking had to be abandoned. Though some, sort of, um, though some of us resisted, we found no great difficulty in casting aside such feelings. Faced with alcoholic destruction, we soon became as open-minded on spiritual matters as we had tried to be on, on uh, other questions. In this respect, alcohol was a great persuader. It finally beat us into a state of reasonableness. Sometimes this was a tedious process. We hope no one else will be prejudiced for, long as, uh, for as long as some of us were. See, this is the thing. Uh, alcohol is a great persuader. It beats us into reasonableness. But if alcoholism isn't beating us into reasonableness, we're going to remain unreasonable. And a lot of times you find, especially in treatment, you find very unreasonable people in treatment. They just, they have a problem with everything. They have a problem with uh, the, pro, the program of uh, 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 the, the, the methodology of the treatment center. They've got a problem with this person. They've got a problem with that person. They haven't been beaten into a state of reasonableness. I, I know, I, I'm not saying I didn't argue, you know, when I first got sober, but, uh, but I knew that if I argued too much, I would argue myself away from the thing that could save me. Mm. And that was, um, that was really what kept me as quiet as, 
as, as I could possibly be. <coughs> Excuse me. The reader may, may still ask why he should believe in a power greater than himself. We think there are good reasons. Let's have a look at some of them. The practical individual of today is a stickler for facts and results. Nevertheless, the 20th century readily accepts theories of all kinds, provided they are firmly grounded in fact. We have numerous theories, for example, about electricity. Everybody believes them without a murmur of a doubt. Why this ready acceptance? Simply because it is, it is impossible to explain what we see, feel, direct, and use without reasonable assumption as a starting point. Mm. You know, that, that's a great uh, example. When, when you walk into your studio, Monty, you, sl you flip on a switch and the lights come on. Yeah. Now, do you know every single thing that's involved with uh, electrical theory and light bulb design that causes that to happen? I know absolutely nothing other than turning on the switch. But you know, you know almost without a doubt that when you flip that switch, the light is going to come on. You bet. The same kind of thing with these spiritual practices. We need to get to a point where we trust in them. We're never going to know every single thing about God or about the spiritual world. It's, 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 I don't know that uh, the human mind has capacity to understand everything at every single level. But we can get to a point where we trust that when we throw the switch, it's going to work. Yeah. Everybody nowadays believes in scores of assumptions for which there is good evidence but no perfect visual proof. And does not science demonstrate that visual proof is the weakest proof? Especially since 1939 when this was written. You know, Einstein came out with uh, E equals MC squared, which basically uh, showed that time is not uh, a static, time can be stretched and light can be stretched and it, it blew all kinds of uh, uh, concepts of physics uh, out of the water. And particle physics today, they're, they're understanding that, uh, that particles really aren't particles, they're waves. And, you know, the more we learn, the more we understand that some of the things we used to know uh, really aren't accurate. You know, that happens in science, and it can happen in the spiritual world, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is being constantly revealed as mankind studies the material world, that outward appearances are not inward reality at all. To illustrate... The steel girder is a mass of electrons whirling around each other at an incredible speed. These tiny bodies are governed by precise laws, and these laws hold true throughout the material world. Science tells us so. We have no reason to doubt it. When, however, the perfectly logical assumption is suggested that underneath the material world and life as we see it, there is an all-powerful, guiding, creative intelligence Right there, our perverse streak comes to the surface, and we laboriously set out to convince ourselves it isn't so. We read wordy books and indulge in windy arguments, thinking we believe uh, that this universe needs no God to explain it. Were our contentions true, it would follow that life originated out of nothing, means nothing, and proceeds nowhere. I really love that paragraph, because uh, it, it takes you from a very cold scientific understanding of the world uh, to something much more wonderful, much more embracing of spirituality and creative intelligence. Uh, I mean, I, w I would rather believe in, in creative uh, intelligence than I, would, than I would not. You know, one of the stories um, uh, from, uh, from the early days when Bill and Bob were bopping around was there was an individual who was, uh, who was president of the Atheist Society in New York City. This guy wouldn't let anybody uh, talk about God in the meetings, and you know he'd make us stink. I don't want to. There is no God. I don't. Wanna, and he, he was a real problem. And uh, Bill Wilson and Hank Parkhurst uh, were were part of this thing called Honor Dealers. It was really Hank's business. But what they did was they decided uh, that they needed to get rid of this guy. He was he was messing the meetings up so bad that what they did was they invented a product for this guy to sell and then hired him and, and put him on commission and sent him, uh, sent him away to go sell this thing just to get rid of him, can you imagine? <laughs> and what happened was he ended up in another city. It was Philadelphia or something. He got drunk as a skunk. And, uh, and at that point, uh, 
during that last detox, he had a spiritual experience. And when he showed back up in New York City, he wasn't mad about being duped as far as the job was concerned. He went back there telling them, you guys were right all along. Uh, you know, <laughs> I've, I've had that spiritual awakening. I know what you're all talking about now. Mm -hmm. And this was an individual who was uh, president of an atheist organization. Yeah, that's great. So again, you know, s sometimes we just need to let our experience uh, guide us in these paths and be, you know, be open-minded and, and willing to set aside that prejudice. Sure. Instead of regarding ourselves as intelligent agents, spearheads of God's ever-advancing creation, we agnostics and atheists choose to believe that our human intelligence was the last word, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Rather vain, wasn't it? We who have traveled this dubious path beg you to lay aside prejudice. This is like the fifth time they've asked you. Even against organized religion, we have learned that whatever the human frailties of various faiths may be, those faiths have given purpose and direction to millions. People of faith have a logical idea of what life is all about. Actually, we used to have no reasonable conception whatever. We used to amuse ourselves by cynically dissecting spiritual beliefs and practices when we might have observed that many spiritually minded persons of all races, colors, and creeds were demonstrating a degree of stability, happiness, and usefulness which we should have sought for ourselves. So again, would you rather be right or would you rather be stable, happy, and useful? Yeah. I would much sure. rather be stable, happy, and useful, my friend. I'll, t I'll tell you, I would too. Yeah. Instead, we looked at the human defects of these people and sometimes used their shortcomings as a basis of wholesale condemnation. We talked of intolerance while we were intolerant ourselves. We missed the reality and the beauty of the forest because we were diverted by the ugliness of some of its trees. We never gave the spiritual side of life a fair hearing. You, you talked a little bit last week about, uh, about some people uh, in, in religions maybe not living spiritual lives, but but that would that would that stop you from being a religious or a spiritual person yourself? No, no, and and, and it, it's a, now one time it may may have, but no. Uh, why would I want to miss out on that just because somebody else's, you know, de character defects? Absolutely, yeah. I understand. In our personal stories, those are the stories at the back of the book you will find a wide variation in the way each teller approaches and conceives of the power which is greater than himself. If you read those stories, every single one of them practically talks about the experience that leads up to the consciousness of the presence of God. In that, all of these early AAs were agreed. That is the solution. If, if step one is the problem, that we're powerless over alcohol, that we cannot manage our own lives, then step two is an answer to that problem. We need to believe in a power greater than ourselves and access that power. Uh, this is the treatment for alcoholism. A lot of people think there's all kinds of other treatments for alcoholism. The most successful treatment for alcoholism known to man with the absolute best track record is the consciousness of the presence of God in the individual. And again, there's a lot of people that would have problems with that, and this is one of the reasons why Bill is asking again and again and again that you just set aside, you don't have to get rid of, but you need to set aside those prejudices so that you can be open to a new experience. The treatment processes that integrate a lot of spirituality, spiritual principles into uh, their methodology uh, have better success rates sure. than the ones that don't. You know, there's a spectrum. There's the total clinical, total clinical, which they're not even going to mention God, all the way to basically the 12th step treatment centers, the treatment centers that are all about taking you through the steps. You know, those are the two extremes. Uh, but, but uh, you know, what I see is uh, I see that the ones that are more spiritually centered for the people that get through those programs, they have a higher success rate than the, than the clinical ones. Some of the clinical ones have, you know, almost like such a small percentage rate of success that it's, that's unbelievable. Yeah. But here's what's really sad about it. 
as far as reimbursements are concerned, or in other words, insurance or uh, or government um, funding treatment processes, guess, guess which type of treatment center gets the most funding? The clinical. The, the clinical. Yeah. yeah the clinical, because it looks more like a medical treatment. But medical treatments don't work for alcoholism. No. Not, not for they recovery. Don't. You know, they, they do what they do, but... Uh, uh, but the majority of people that go through uh, those type of uh, treatment process don't don't stay sober, uh, but they get reimbursed. Uh, the the places that are all about spirituality and a holistic uh, uh, treatment process, uh, unfortunately, all of those are self pay because there's you know there's no way to convince anybody you know that uh, that this is the right way to do it. It doesn't look right scientifically. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. And I, I agree with a particular approach or conception seems to make little difference. Experience has taught us that these are matters about which, for our purposes, we need not be worried. They are questions for each individual to settle for himself. On one proposition, however, these men and women are strikingly agreed. Every one of them has gained access to and believes in a power greater than themselves. This power has in each case accomplished the miraculous, the humanly impossible. As a celebrated American statesman put it, let's look at the record. Let's look at this paragraph again. Let's, let's say you've been involved in, in different support groups, different treatment centers, and you have yet to recover or yet to be able to stay sober. Um, if, you haven't, if you haven't gained access to and believe in a power greater than yourself, and that power, um, that power um, has not accomplished the miraculous, the humanly impossible, then you haven't participated in the recovery process. Uh, so, so often uh, I'm working with somebody who basically said, well, this fellowship didn't work or that fellowship didn't work. And I ask them, uh, I ask them specifically about uh, consistency at meetings, working the steps through completely, to the best of one's ability, and then uh, working with other people, finding ways to be of service. I'll, I'll ask whether they've done that, and they'll usually say no to, to practically everything except <laughs> maybe the meeting attendance. Yeah. And I'll basically say this: Then you should have drank. You know why? Why did you? Why did you expect to not drink? <laughs> uh, you know, you you can't uh, you can't not work a program of recovery. And then expect recovery. Uh, yeah. th- there's just That'd general work. misunderstanding about uh, about what these support fellowships are about. People think it's about meeting attendance. Meeting attendance is 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 the smallest beginning. Yeah. To what somebody has to engage in to be able to recover. So, you know, if again, if you're if you're out there tonight and you, you've been going every you know to meetings everywhere and treatments everywhere and you're still drinking. You need to ask yourself, were you consistent with meeting attendance? Did you completely work through the steps? I mean, pay, pay back the money, pray and meditate, you know, be completely sure. honest in the fifth step. Are you, have, did you try to carry the message to other people? Did you find ways in your life to be of service? Did you dedicate your life to service? If, if the answers to any of those are no, then you haven't worked, you haven't worked the program. Yeah, that's uh, right. And so why would you expect to be sober anything, or recover. Anything more. Yep, you betcha. We are out of time. Uh, I just, uh, I'm looking forward to more of this We Agnostics. I, I, I really am. This has been really, really cool. And uh, yeah, man, I got to tell you, that happened to me. I thought I could take shortcuts. And until I was able to follow a few simple steps and do them thoroughly, nothing changed, Chris. There has to be such significant, fundamental, revolutionary change yeah. in us as human beings uh, for us to move away from from powerlessness. It's 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 you know you you have to know that. Um, so often we believe that we just need to not want to drink more, and yeah. it has almost nothing to do. Uh, with a recovery process. No. <laughs> well, my friends, it, it, this is great stuff. Please feel free to to download uh, this show to your hard drive or MP3 player. Share it with somebody. 
Uh, next week we're going to be talking uh, about the next portion, uh, part three of We Agnostics. Chris, thank you so much, my friend. Monty, love the opportunity. All right. Everybody, tell everybody else about our show, Walking Through the Big Book with Chris Schroeder. And until next week, when we walk through the big book, we're wishing God serenity for you. Bye-bye. This has been a broadcast of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting. (laughs) 